Okay, Mr. Marshall, I have 635. You have a quorum of the board here. The attendees are moving on in. Amherst Media is in the house. It looks to me like you're good to go. All right, thanks, Pam. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of November 15th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.35 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Bruce Coldham. Doug, I'm here, and I sh should say that I'm not feeling terribly well, and I'll try, but I may not last the meeting out. All right, thank you. Uh, Jesse Major? Present. Janet McGowan? Here. Karen Winter? Present. Uh, has Fred Hartwell arrived? Uh, I do not see him, so we'll have to notice when he shows up. I, Doug Marshall, am present and Johanna Newman. I'm here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. For the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the, minute, from the meeting. All right. Um, let's go ahead into the first item on our agenda, which is minutes. And Chris, uh, I don't believe we have any minutes in our packet for this evening. Uh, is that accurate? That is accurate. We do not have minutes. We are missing two minutes from your regular meetings and two minutes from your in-person meetings, but we'll put our noses to the grindstone and get those done as soon as we can. Okay, thank you. So we will move on from there. Let's see, participants. I see that we have 21 public uh, participants in the attendees list. I'm sure some of them are part of tonight's presentation, but this is the time that I usually read the names of the people that I can see in the attendees list. Uh, this is so that those who the, the, those attendees can see or can hear 
who else is in the meeting? Uh, that, so I, I see Alex Lef, Lefebvre, uh, Austin Surratt, Bob Parent, Bonnie Eisman, Elizabeth Veerling, Eugene Gofredo, Farah Amin, Ginny Hamilton, Georgia Barnhill, Jess Schoendorf, Josephine Penta, Kent Farber, Lee Edwards, Mara Keene, Pamela Rooney, Rachel Love Loeffler from Berkshire Design, uh, just the name Rob, Sharon Sherry from the library, Tamson Ely, and Tim Alex. All right, um, members of the public, do you have any general public comments you'd like to make this evening at this time uh, on a topic not appearing later on the agenda? In other words, not related to the library. Okay, so I don't see any hands raised from the public. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and go into our public meetings. And uh, I believe, so we're going to do three public hearings simultaneously. And these three hearings were advertised to start at 635. 640 and 645. So I see now it's 642. And so I'm going to, Chris, am I allowed to go ahead and read the, in, the topic at this time before all three have started? I think you can read the topics, yes. Okay, so I'll read those and hope that it takes three minutes, although I'd be surprised if it does. And we may have to just pause for a couple of minutes before we get into this. All right, so in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SP, uh, Site Plan Review 2024-02 at the Jones Library at 43 Amity Street. Request Site Plan Review approval to remove and replace the 1993 edition with a new addition that meets current codes and improves accessibility and access under section 3.334 of the zoning bylaw. Property is located in the BG general business district and, and on map 14A parcel 36. The second hearing to be opened this evening to run simultaneously will be special permit 2024-01, um, also at the Jones Library at 43 Amity Street, a request for a special permit to continue and enlarge a structure with existing non-conforming dimensional setbacks in accordance with section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw. Again, in the BG General Business District, a map 14A and parcel 36. And the third hearing to run at this time is special permit 2024-02, also at the Jones Library at 43 Amity Street, request special permit to extinguish previous special permit from FY90, 1990-07, pertaining to the 1993 edition uh, proposed to be removed. Again, in the BG zoning district, map 14A and parcel 36. 
So I managed to stretch that out right to nine to, to 645. So for those of you joining us, we have just uh, opened three simultaneous hearings, all related to the Jones Library at, nine, at 43 Amity Street, uh, our site plan review hearing, as well as two special permit hearings. And uh, so with that, uh, board members, are there any disclosures that you all would like to make for this, um, for these hearings this evening? I guess I will say that I uh, have contributed to the Jones Library's fundraising campaign. And so uh, I wanted everybody to know that. I do believe I can be a relative, an impartial judge of the issues that will be before us. Anything any, anybody else wants to say? Uh, Johanna. Um, I have not contributed to the capital campaign, but I have contributed to the Friends of the Jones Library. So I don't, in the spirit of disclosure, I also think it makes it possible for me to participate in the conversation and vote. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, so let's see. So with that, I guess we should uh, welcome the members of uh, the, the applicants' representatives. Uh, Sharon, I, I see you. Maybe you uh, ought to take the lead, introduce your team, and give us your presentation this evening. Sure. Hi, everybody. I was wondering if you could let a couple more people in. Sure. Who would um, they be? Can we start with Trustee President Austin Sarah? All right, he's in. Okay, uh, Jess Schoendorf from Berkshire Design. There we go. Tim Alex from Colliers. What was the name again? Tim Alex, A-L-I-X. Okay. And then Tony Shao from Feingold Alexander. And there is our team. I'd actually uh, like to invite Austin Sarah, uh, president of the trustees to introduce uh, what you're about to see this evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the members of the planning board uh, for the, the work that you're doing. It's a pleasure to be here and we're really looking forward to the to conversation that we're gonna have uh, tonight. Uh, I'm again grateful for your attention. I'm also chair of the Jones Library Building Committee, and we are thrilled to have representatives of Berkshire Design and FAA and Colliers uh, here to speak to the issues uh, before you. So I'm I'm going to actually ask uh, Tony, uh, who who from your team will be going first. I will make the introduction and we'll thank, start thank with. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Austin. Um, I'm Tony Shaw from Feingold Alexander. And we'll start with our portion first and related to the building, and then we'll follow by Rachel on the landscape and site work. So I'm going to see if I can share a screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, I'm going to try to go to full screen mode. Can you still see it? Yes, and okay. it, is full, it is full screen. Great. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much um, for everyone's participating tonight. Um, we look forward to our ongoing uh, dialogue and conversation with you folks. So I'm just going to lead you through where we are. Um, and uh, along the way, if there are questions, just let me know. So, of course, we're looking at the Jones Library, and it, it's going to start with first understanding what the changes are to the existing 
historic 1927-28 building. So the way we've organized this is that in these next series of drawings, um, these are series of elevations and the areas identified in pink are the portions that will be removed. Um, and then you'll see what's proposed. These are starting first with the south elevation, which of course is the main uh, elevation from the front. And here you can start to see that we are proposing the addition, which is not that visible uh, from this particular vantage point, which is outlined in those areas identified in the pink and colored zone. As we turn to the east elevation, again, the portion that is uh, quite a bit back in the distance that is going to be removed, which is really the 1990s portion. And here shows the proposed addition. Um, and a part of it, as you can see, merges to the right uh, with the uh, sort of gambrel end. And then the portions that are identified pink, those are sort of really recessed back uh, behind the existing elevation on the east. Uh, from the north, um, there's again the area in pink, uh, which is again the 1990s edition, is proposed to be demolished. And this is the proposed new edition. And because again, the north elevation adds in front of this particular side. So what you're really seeing here is everything uh, in the pink area is all new. And then the existing is beyond and behind. Uh, from the west, this is the proposed excuse me, existing, again, mostly 1990s edition that is going to be demolished. And this is the proposed west elevation that is shown here in pink, uh, organizing in place of what was there. And we can certainly get into details later, but this is the extent of the elevations in terms of the demolition and proposed addition. Um, just by way of information, uh, part of the questions, um, for example, that came up with historical review is that when we're replacing the windows in the historic um, 1927 edition, excuse me, original library, um, it has single pane glazing. Um, we are proposing essentially to replace with double glazed, much more energy efficient windows, but we're attempting to uh, match the profile of those windows so it retains the appearance of the windows. It creates a um, true subdivided light that again retains the grid pattern, but all of these are with much more energy efficient windows that are going to replace the existing single pane windows that are in the historic part of the library. And these are a series of section drawings to the right and then window jam details to the left, showing the difference between the proposed and existing. This next um, image basically illustrates where new uh, materials are emerging in addition as well. So the lower right photo is the existing image um, along the main street and the uh, rendering up above is what is really being identified. So starting with number one, that will be a new synthetic slate roof um, on the uh, portions that are identified on the historic. There will be the new windows that match the existing that I just described in the previous slide. Uh, we, we will repoint 50% of the masonry on the original library. The new gutters and downspouts will match existing. If we do not restore in kind, they will basically match exactly what's there in gutter and copper. <clears throat> and then new paint will be applied to 10% of painted surfaces as needed for touch up, which is identified as number five. As we look at it from the other view um, uh, along the main street, again, here shows number one, the new synthetic slate roof the new windows that will match the existing, the repointing of 50% of the masonry, the new gutters and downspouts, downspouts that will match the existing, and again, new paint that will uh, deal with 10% of the painted surfaces of the existing. And this also begins to show the proposed addition. Um, from, the, um, from the backside, which is largely in this case showing the new addition, uh, what is being uh, represented here is that it is a series of various materials. Uh, number one is a brick base, which is a darker sort of cold brick color. Um, we had samples that have been left at the library site, and I understand some of you have actually had an opportunity to see it, the actual materials. Uh, number two is a lighter uh, slate gray brick, which basically comprises the, the vast majority of the library above the base condition, as seen in this particular rendering. Uh, number three is um, hardy, hardy barred plank siding, which is largely on the projecting bay element 
uh, as shown in, in number three, and there are shown in a few other areas as well, but this is the predominance of where a particular um, material is going to go. And then number four will be a standing seam uh, metal roof um, system. And again, we have some images of the actual uh, materials in later slides. And the lower right is the existing uh, 1990s version that is coming down. Um, as you look at another view, this is taken from really the garden view approaching um, from the north leading to the to the entrance from this side. Again, uh, here you can see on the base brick, which is the number one, it's the coal brick, the darker color. Number two is the slate lighter gray brick above. Number three is that hardy board siding. And number four is the standing seam metal roof. Uh, and again, the details about the gardens will be followed by Rachel's description later. And the lower right image is what exists now. And as we look at materials in particular, uh, here you can see um, some photo uh, snaps of those two materials. So the coal brick, uh, again, which is on site at the library, is the darker brick at the base. The slate gray brick is the upper portion of the comprises the majority of the library cladding. The hardy bar siding, um, you can see here and shown in detail. And then the standing seam metal roof, um, which is largely a matte finish, is taking um, on top of the roof portions of the proposed addition. And here in a little bit more details, these are some examples uh, or images of the standing seam roof um, that you can see in other instances. Um, as we go towards the front, um, so with regard to the synthetic slate uh, that is replacing the existing slate, it has a, it's manufactured with recycled materials and has a 50 year warranty and can withstand 110 mile hour wind as well and is warranted to that effect. It's available in a wide range of colors and essentially the cost of it is approximately $30 a square foot installed uh, compared to the natural slate at $45 a square foot. So it's definitely uh, saving some significant um, dollars while still being a very high quality um, slate, a synthetic slate product. And another uh, portion uh, that was, I think, I'm sorry, it's taking a little while for this um, file to load. Um, I apologize for the blurriness, but what was asked for also was just an understanding of what's actually the public square footage. So in other words, everything that's in yellow here, um, starting with the guard level on the left, it's here level zero, level one, which is the main arrival level from the front, level two, which is the portion above, and level three, which is in the historic, is the public. So this is where the public has access to all these portions of the library. And then the areas in white, which is an art color, are essentially private staff areas um, or voids um, in cases of double height spaces, which the public generally just does not have access to. But you can see it's a very large extent of the library, essentially, that the public has access throughout. Totally 42,210 square feet of this library. So let's get a bit more into the proposed addition. So what you see in this particular drawing, this is the lower level, uh, what we call the ground floor plan, is the area that is colored in the green, olive green, is the historic 1927, 1928 library. And then everything above that in sort of the black and white is the proposed new addition. The outline in the faint red, that is the proportion of the 1990s edition that is going to be demolished. So you can see how all three of these relate in kind. Similarly, as we look at uh, the main first level, um, again, with the bottom and every place the plan is oriented, so the bottom of the page is facing towards Main Street. So again, the 1927, 1928 historic library is in green in this L configuration. And then everything beyond that in the black and white is the proposed addition. And again, the red dash outline is the proposed 1990s portion that is uh, to be demolished. Uh, and as we move up to level two, um, again, the same thing, the olive green is the existing 2728 historic library. The white and black is the proposed addition and the red outline is the 1990s portion that is proposed to be demolished. And then finally, as we get to the very top uh, levels of the historic portions and levels three down the bottom and level four up above of those portions will essentially you know, be um, renovated. 
Uh, there is a, a an elevator portion that exists, excuse me, that's proposed, which my mouse is circling here, that is in order to train accessible access with a new elevator coming up to this level um, from below. So that is what is shown here, uh, which essentially is being added in order to create accessibility to this level. And again, uh, this is a, a, a repeat of what I just showed you on the demolition, but again, as a, as a reminder, this is the south elevation, the proposed addition in pink. The east elevation with the proposed addition in pink. And just with respect to details, there are a lot of notes here um, regarding to accessibility, uh, creating some modest openings and some other things. Um, some of that, if there are questions, we can get back into, but essentially the big bulk of these elevations shows the proposed um, addition, as well as pointing out where the penthouses and elevator overruns mechanical screens occur. Again, from the north elevation, um, shown in pink, you know, in front of the uh, existing historic part. And again, from the west elevation, the proposed addition uh, as it relates to the historic library to the right. And as we talk about some of the details um, that were mentioned previously, so at the existing front entrance, um, and again, Rachel will get much more into the landscape part, we are going to make this fully universally accessible. So we are raising the plinth uh, access um, in order to eliminate the steps leading to the front library and just in terms of minor um, but important details there will be a book return which is shown here uh, in between the window jam and the and the historic front entry uh, which we propose to be in a kind of bronze copper color in order to sort of um, make it sort of more dematerialized and although it's not shown in level of detail but it came up in the previous um, other meetings we will take this particular pilaster here and what we are going to propose to do is there currently this of course right now is shown cutting off the base we are going to rebuild this portion of the base of this um, trim raise it and build a base back and elevate that part so this will enable this to create the, the framework of the entrance um, but addressed to the new accessible entrance which levels this whole front area and the other thing that you're just pointing out here in the roof plan um, uh, the question and related to mechanical screens so Shown in yellow here are the areas which we will be screening uh, rooftop mechanical systems on the proposed new addition, which are outlined here and here. And with respect to what this looks like in these kind of 3D massing models, this is the view from Amity Street at the southeast corner. And here you can see where the mechanical screens um, just barely pops up and is visible in this location here. Um, this is the elevator penthouse here which pops up to connect to that level. From the uh, Amity Street looking in the southwest corner, again, here you can see where the proposed mechanical screen is shown here, which is on the new addition. From the North Prospect Street um, elevation, again, you can see where the mechanical screen, which is almost not really visible on top of the existing, excuse me, related to the new, and finally, from the um, north corner of the um, proposed addition here, you can see uh, where that mechanical screen um, is just visible, peeking up here at the backside of this proposed new addition. The details of that uh, proposing is essentially a metal system. Um, we'll have a very fine grain pattern to allow air to flow through, but we'll screen the mechanical equipment behind. And then finally, this is just coming back to a corner view of the library as seen from the corner on Amity Street with the proposed addition visible here. Um, th these next series of images that I'm gonna lead into, Rachel will now talk to the landscape details and design. So just tell me when to advance, Rachel. Thanks, Tony. Um, thanks, everyone. So we'll we'll provide um, some more more of these presentation graphics to talk about today. But any of the specific questions you have, we can answer. And then we also have included in this presentation copies of the technical drawings that were submitted as part of the permit application. So happy to talk about whatever is helpful today. Um, so this first image shows. Uh, can you go back, Tony? Sure. Sorry. 
first image shows the, the extent of the property line for the Jones Library and its relationship to the abutting properties and uses. Uh, the Jones Library is a zone um, general business, um, but it borders the, the a residential zone where the Amherst uh, Strong House resides. Uh, on the east are the Drake, the Works, and the Fire Station, and to the north is the um, CBS parking lot and CBS area. Across the street from Amity Street is a public parking lot and um, Amherst Coffee Cinema and People's Bank, and I'm a, a, a Pretty, pretty large um, crosswalk that connects the parking lot to the library. Okay, next slide. These are some, I know a bunch of you <laughs> went out last night in, in, in the darkness. So this is what it would look like in daylight, um, probably in a couple months from now. Uh, so the image at the top shows the crosswalk going into the, into the library, um, that historical front that um, Tony shared with us before. Some of the significant trees to the left in that image actually are on the strong house property that Norway spruce and um, the heritage sycamore way beyond that. The image at the right at the top shows um, what is now the main accessible entry into the library. So um, patrons who are mobily challenged um, are directed to a different entrance. And that's one of the things that this design actually helps um, solve and, and improve for the library. Uh, the image at the left in the middle shows um, the connection from the strong house to the street with oversized Goshen stone steps. And images at the bottom show the current condition behind the library on the north side as we look towards that CVS lot, which actually um, is really an undulating landscape with earthen mounds that are three to four feet high. And we, um, looking back at plans from the 1990s, it looks like that pathway was actually cut into existing grades to get access to the lower level. Um, the image at the right shows that heritage sycamore, which is a, um, a very beloved tree in Amherst, which we're going to try to protect in the project. And the image in the lower left shows that existing entrance on the north side. It's really hard to see. It's blocked by vegetation and terrain. So it's another area that we're going to improve. Next slide. Sure. Uh, early in the process, we um, found some historic postcards of the library shortly after it was constructed and then in the two decades since. And we're looking at how the landscape was treated or considered, um, also how circulation um, was addressed for pedestrians and vehicles. It's interesting that um, the parking has taken place in a different orientation along Amity Street, more head in parking along the main street, and that access and parking have been uh, to the east of the building in all those years. Okay, next slide. This is uh, a, a view similar to what we saw before with, with some coloration to identify different areas of the existing site. So the beige color shows areas of paving. Um, the dark green shows areas of planting and the light green shows uh, lawn areas. You can see from this in from the slide, um, there are two Chinese dogwoods out front flanking the front of the building that will be retained. Um, some of the smaller trees around the periphery are going to be removed and two large shade trees in the back are going to be removed. One is actually, um, is thriving because it has grown into the existing sewer line. So it's getting lots of wonderful nutrition, um, but unfortunately that line is not in good condition and um, has to go and so does the tree. And the other tree is um, where we would need to manage storm water on site. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Next slide. Um, Jess in our office who you met uh, yesterday during the site visit has done an extensive detailing of the existing paving materials on site. There's a lot of granite and Goshen stone that we're looking at incorporating with our proposed work. So for example, the, the granite pavers that you see in the middle image on the left, um, we're going to introduce as bands into concrete paving on site. Um, the granite uh, granite bench in the lower left will either be used as piers for the rain garden bridge or incorporated in as another seating element in the future rain garden. Um, and next slide. These are more images of the stones out back that we're going to repurpose. Several of them will be used for 
stone seat walls that are um, in both the front and the back of the of the new project. Next slide. Um, and then this is a summary of, of Jess's findings on the site. Next slide. This is an illustrative plan showing uh, what we envision the future project to look like uh, with respect to the property line and adjacent neighbors. Um, so for as a, you know, one of the big, big um, goals of this project is to make it universally accessible. And we're really, really excited and proud that, that we could make that happen. Um, another thing that we wanted to do is there's a lot of pedestrian conflicts today on site uh, where the, the, the parking area and the access drive on the existing site is really narrow. And to turn around, you actually have to drive behind the library um, towards the shed that's back there, turn around and try not to hit a pedestrian. A lot of pedestrians walk from the CVS parking lot area through the parking lot and drive to get to get to Main Street and Amity Street. So one of the things that we've achieved with this design is we've actually um, we've actually increased the size of the parking area up near Amity Street to allow for seven dedicated parking spaces that meet dimensional standards so that you can pull into the parking lot, park your car, back out and back back and drive back out onto Amity Street. So no pedestrian, no patrons or visitors will need to drive to the back of the site to turn around their vehicle. They will be contained within the front of the site. Um, in addition, we flip the parking. So the parking faces the building. So that means that um, for, especially for those who are using the accessible walkway, um, getting out of the car and getting into the building without having to cross traffic is another safety improvement. In the front of the building, we've uh, introduced uh, a symmetrical sidewalk that runs parallel to the building. And I'll show you in another slide how that helps us achieve our ADA. So we don't need any ramps or railings in the site. We're able to, to take patrons from Amity Street from the parking area right to the main front door for both for all, all users of all abilities. Um, to the left, south southwest of the library, we've expanded a lot of uh, the children's area out to create a dedicated children's courtyard area that has a small fence and shrubbery around it. Um, we have now a patio in front at the main entry with a stone wall for people who want to sit and talk or meet. Uh, to the southeast between the library and the parking area, we have more of a quiet reflective area. We're showing Adirondack chairs that might be movable that folks could come and sit and read a book underneath the new shade tree. And in the north side of the site, uh, we have, we're introducing um, a new stormwater garden to meet the increased rainfall amounts that we're facing these days. And one of the surprises we had on the project is that we realized that the, the library site itself actually processes a lot of the storm water coming from the historical society property. Water comes from the historical society property during a heavy rainfall event, goes into the backyard of the library and out into the municipal system on North Pleasant Street. So we're able to accommodate all of that with, with what we're seeing from climate change in this area, but we've also made it a place for people to gather, um, sit, reflect, which I'll talk about later. Um, and then we have uh, a, a working or reading patio on the north side of the building um, with higher, higher chairs and tables. And then we have a little north terrace on the northwest side of the building underneath catenary lighting. Um, so we'll talk about that all in more detail. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is a view from Amity Street of kind of what we're thinking um, with the new landscaping out front. So what we're seeing in the foreground is the new, the new, new access drive into the library. Parking now is on facing the library. Um, we have a, a shrub row between the parking and the library. Um, and we've got we've gotten some really good feedback on plant selection from various stakeholders and groups. Um, so what's shown here on the right is um, oak leaf hydrangea. And one of the comments we got from the design review board is that closer to the street along this row that we might wanna consider a smaller shrub, which we have in our plans. Um, and then in addition um, in that Southeast corner, 
is the sour wood tree, which is a lovely native tree. It flowers and turns red in the in the fall. It'll be a nice, nice small, not too big, not the Goldilocks of trees, not too big, not too small. Provide a little bit of shade. Uh, we're proposing two magnolia trees out front. Again, they're in that 25 foot high range at maturity. They'll provide some seasonal color and interest and really frame the library. Uh, next slide. This is a view from the north side. Um, so if you were standing at the CVS parking lot and looking towards the new addition of the library, this is what you would see. So we have the new two accessible walkways with direct access to the north entry of the library. We've got our uh, stone walls and seating area on the north side of the library. Um, we have the slightly recessed stormwater garden uh, with sedges and bulbs and stepping stones. We have a retaining wall at the border of the Historical Society property. Um, and we're proposing uh, new trees within, within the site. Next slide. Um, these are some section elevations through the landscape, the, through the sidewalk at the front. So the one at the top is a slice through that accessible walkway that I described showing how we're able to stay under 5%, um, making sure that we're able to bring people up to the finished floor of the main door so people will be able to walk into the building easily. And the one on the bottom shows the same, how we're making that accessible connection on the north side flush. Next slide. On the, on the west side, the Historical Society property side, we are um, going to be removing some shrubs that are there now and um, concentrating any pedestrian circulation at the, at the existing building as an emergency egress only. Again, that's an accessible walkway with a low site retaining wall. And then on the east side, uh, we are able to provide a 4.85% walkway all the way from that parking lot up at the top towards Amity Street all the way to the back. So we now have a dedicated accessible pathway from front to back, north to south as well. Next slide. Um, site lighting fixtures. Uh, we, we do have a bit of a challenge um, at this site in particular. One, we want, to, we want to be dark sky compliant and minimize light trespass and be as dark as we can be, but at the same time, we want safety and visibility. And um, we also have a historic uh, preservation restriction on the property and they're keeping in character with that, with the historic site and what's there already on the building. So we're sort of trying to navigate um, these different priorities and, and, and making the best decisions we can. So when we looked at uh, lighting the site, we tried to, um, reference the existing light fixtures that are there today and that are out at the street, kind of keep in character, but improve the optics and the photometrics on them so they um, will have less of an impact. So the image at the top shows sort of the globe light pole pot fixtures that are in the backyard today. And then the image on the right shows the um, large 20 foot high arm fixture right out front. So when we looked at the site, um, anywhere where we need to have pathway lighting pole mounted, um, that the fixture on the left, lower left, um, we used another pole mounted fixture, similar kind of shape and size, more angular, but it's allowing us to introduce um, shielding within. So I'll talk about this in more detail, but it is it, it does reduce the amount of light trespass and impact on the project. The next and the one on the right um, is our parking lot fixture light. So where we have parking lot fixtures, um, or again, these are smaller in height. They're only 12 foot high, not the uh, 20 foot high that you see at the street on Amity Street. But these um, will, these are also, you know, they've got a, a full cut off fixture um, and kind of keeping that character as we move around the historic side of the building. Next slide. We really also try not to have vertical obstructions between, between the public right away, the public street and the front of the building. So 
we tried really hard to avoid having full mounted fixtures out front in front of the building. Um, one, because that might impact our standing with the historic preservation restriction. And two, um, from a you know from a perception level, the as many barriers as we can remove, vertical barriers between someone and the front of a building makes it feel more inviting and welcoming. As we went through many iterations on this photometric plan, it looked like we would have, we could not get a, um, we could not provide enough lighting with just wall mounted lighting and the, and the pole mounted lights that we mentioned before. So we added in um, bollard lighting along the front uh, in the planting bed. So the, we have this 24 inch metal bollard light. Um, it's painted the same color to match the site fences. Um, and it um, is in the shrubbery, so it, it will be less, less of a visual barrier, but it'll provide some of that essential lighting on the front path. In addition, we've introduced um, some under, under wall lighting underneath the seat walls that are at the front, again, kind of helping sneak in more lighting along that pathway. What's nice about both of these is that the light levels are really low to the ground and will be less likely to um, provide glare in someone's eye as they're walking. Next slide. Um, this is a breakdown of all the fixtures on site, uh, where they're located and their bug rating. Um, bug is a, a, a way to quantify the light, um, light impacts. So, U for and the bug is uplight and bug uplight of zero means great there's no 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 uplight at all um, which means it won't be contributing to the light pollution um, B for in the bug is backlight and that's anything that's going behind the fixture and G is glare anything going in front of the fixture so each of these lights have different ratings of of bug um, Tony could you would you be Able to zoom in at all to the. I'm not sure I can do that on this share thing. Um, let me see. Oh, maybe. Uh, maybe try Control Plus. Let me see if I can do that. Yeah, that didn't work. Okay. Um, no, sorry. It's okay. We can we can uh, circulate a copy of this tube after the meeting for you guys to zoom to zoom in um, and out. But um, what we what we have done is we've taken the photometric plan that's provided by the lighting engineer um, and to make it easier for you to see, we've highlighted in yellow areas where we have different levels of light. So the darker yellow areas um, have more more foot candles falling on the ground. And the areas that are white have no candles, no light on the ground. Um, and then areas that are in between are, are so you know those transition areas between fixtures. As we're looking at the site too, we're trying to eliminate really hot spots and trying to get a uniform distribution of light across the site. Um, we try to keep all the lights on paths above 0.5 foot candles and trying to keep most lighting within five five foot candles to 0.5 foot candles. We did um, have to introduce shielding on one of the pole mounted lights at the retaining wall by the historical society, just to keep light trespass from, from crossing over there. Um, so you can see in the North garden where, the, where those three pole mounted light fixtures are and where they cast light, um, they do have depending which way they face, they have a wider wider spread. So you can see we have minimal trespass across the property line, um, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. Um, and then at the north uh, seating area, we have under canopy lights and those light fixtures would be completely shielded from up light by the actual canopy of the building. And then, as we work our way to the north entry, again, we have lights underneath the canopy at the main entry. Um, I think those are about five foot candles in that location. And then in the terrace area, under we have catenary lightings, lighting that's suspended from cables. Um, and those are around three foot candles. As we work around the building, 
on the west egress area, we haven't we have a 13 inch high, high retaining wall that provides that accessibility pathway out. And then we've integrated wall lighting into that that are downcast to the path only. Um, that's one way that we're able to get light at the property line. We do have a little bit of trespass there on that side um, because we have historical fixtures. The, the F1 and F2 and F3 fixtures are matching what's on the library today. So these are more like hurricane lamp fixtures um, with no shielding or no control. And that's why there's a little bit of trespass on, on, on the property line. We do have um, we do have some lighting again, those same kind of historical sconces around that front courtyard area. And then we do have baller lighting along the main entry path. The two hot spots are in are like three to three to four foot candles within the parking lot. And you can see how they how they spill out from those fixtures. So again, those pole mounted fixtures we wanted to have them opposite the library so they weren't blocking um, blocking views or creating light um, light coming in your eyes from below. And the fixture at the street um, sheds a lot of light now for the crosswalk. but as we get towards um, towards the historical society property and right away it is actually there's zero foot candles there. Okay. next slide. This is a slide showing some of the materials that we're thinking of as um, in, in the project. So the image at the upper right shows the type of fencing that we're planning for the dumpster enclosure. Um, originally, this was going to be six feet high from the top of the fence to the bottom, but during the historical society review, it was pointed out to us that we might want to go higher just to be sure that we're screening the dumpsters from view. So um, right now the plans, the revised plans we sent you show a 7.5 foot high fence for this area to accommodate that, that grill pattern at the top and um, complete screening below the dumpster. We do have a, a series of short stairs at the front just for anyone who wants to take that direct line from the, from the crosswalk into the main library. And we're using a historical type railing um, for that. That would require a, a variance from the MAAB, but we've been able to get this variance at Amherst College and other institutions in the area. The railing in the middle right and the middle top is the type of railing that we'll be using on the top of the retaining wall at the back and also the type of railing that we'll be using around the children's area. Uh, in the children's area, this will have a four foot high evergreen um, shrub in front of it. So it's more for, for safety than anything. We're integrating the Goshen stone into walls and benches. And the image on the upper left is our idea of the rain garden crossing. That's um, a change in materials to let the water through and sort of express those stormwater connections. In the children's area, we're looking at using stamps in the concrete of 12 birds of Amherst, their, their feet patterns and their shape and their feathers. They're things that, that kids could color in with crayons, but again, it gives that a little bit more texture to the courtyard area. Next slide. Um, for working tables in the back, we're thinking pops of color be fun. Um, different working table heights for kids, for people with um, who might be in wheelchairs and then people who might want to have a higher height. So the mix of those tables and colors. Uh, we're providing bike racks on site. So we have four racks in the front and four racks at the back, uh, increasing bike storage and allowing for up to 16 bikes on site. And then the image in the center of the bottom one is the repurposed stone benches that we have um, in both the front and the back. Next slide. This is a deep, more detailed study of what that North Terrace with the catenary lighting might be like. Um, we have, we're proposing a unitized paver walkway that extends out towards the north, towards CVS, and between that and the retaining wall, introducing crushed stone seating areas with movable chairs, the catenary lighting, 
and uh, climbing vines like climbing hydrangea or clematis. Next slide. And this is a cross section of that area. Um, the image on the left is the new, the new proposed addition, that terrace area and the retaining wall. And the image on the right shows an elevation of what you would be looking at when you're looking out from the north side of the library at that wall. We do have some oversized terrace steps on the left, which connect someone up to the Historical Society property, but also provide additional program seating area. You know, someone could go with a book, maybe a cushion, and read, read outside. Next slide. As we develop planting palettes for the project, we thought a lot about the character of the historic front. Um, and how we might, and the character in the back and the new edition and how we might celebrate those differences while creating a uniform palette. Out front, we are, we're trying to use a, a refrain palette of very few colors. Um, so the magnolia, the yellow magnolia will be a splash of color, but for the most part, we're sticking with dark greens, light purples and whites. Next slide. And then in the back, um, we heard feedback from many stakeholders that safety is a, is a big issue there today. It's a big challenge. Having sight lines through visibility, having connectivity to the historical society property as well, and then ease of maintenance. So as we thought about all these things, um, we looked at what we could do in that ground plane, um, what we could plant that would be able to handle the stormwater, be able to keep things open, have some interest, and be easier to maintain. So we're looking at a combination of sheet moss and carex, which is a type of, it looks like grass, but you don't have to mow it, um, and bulbs, minor bulbs, to create carpets of different shapes and sizes and forms um, in, the, in the garden. Next slide. So this is an enlargement view of the front planting area. Uh, at the left is the children's courtyard area. Um, where again, we have the evergreen Cunningham's white shrub. It's nice because it kind of has that um, more traditional New England kind of feel to it. It blooms prolifically with white flowers in the spring and it kind of has soft, softer edges. It's not something that we would be trimming. Um, it would be allowed to, to take its original form and it it's very well behaved. It doesn't get any higher than four feet. So it it, um, it won't block off views, and, but it will also be a nice, nice border plant. We've integrated the Chinese dogwood into that planting bed. And then um, the sourwood tree, which I mentioned before, um, which can provide a shade for people who want to read in the front. The two buttercup magnolia trees on center with the library. And then the oak leaf hydrangea between the parking area and the sidewalk. and um, and the Aronia, the dwarf Aronia, um, between the walkway and, and Amity Street. Next slide. And then this is the large amount of the area at the north, the stormwater garden. Um, so again, we have, you know, we are creating a bowl now. And so where things were raised up with the paths cut through, we're actually cutting down a, a giant, a, a three, three foot bowl in the, in the back to be able to store the, the amount of rainwater that are, is anticipated in our area. Um, in that area, we're also repurposing some of those stones that, from site to create stepping stone paths that wind through the rain garden. And that'll create with larger boulders and repurpose granite found on site, um, more seating areas in the garden. So the, um, for, for trees, we're going to plant um, two swamp white oaks. We originally had a had a had a willow oak, which um, are really lovely. But um, we got good feedback from the shade tree committee that they don't tend to do so well in Amherst, even though they do well in North Adams. Um, so we are they advised us that we might want to plant two swamp white oaks. Those trees will do really well with climate change, they are well Southern adapted and Northern adapted and can handle the drought conditions and the water conditions that we think this area will be subjected to. We have some fringe trees for understory trees along the CVS border to the dumpster for them. And then 
um, for proposing a sassafras tree closer to the library. Again, a good native and one that can handle um, the incoming climate change challenges that our landscapes are gonna face. Okay, next slide. Um, maybe let's go up to the couple more slides, Tony. These are, these are the plans that were submitted in the package that you received. And then this is a new plan that again, we had some really good feedback from Bob Parrott and from Guilford and DPW about how we, what the logistics might look like during construction and how we might want to guide the contractor in, in making, making this work. Um, so on this logistics plan, which we submitted in our updated package to you, we're showing construction fencing around the perimeter of the library property. We are showing um, closure of the, of the parallel parking spaces out front of the library in the right of way and um, redirecting the bike lane. We're also showing fencing around the bike lane. We're installing signage indicating that the bike that bikes and vehicles have to share the lane of traffic. Um, we've introducing si uh, signage to indicate that sidewalks are closed. We're introducing signage across the street from the crosswalks and up at the corners, letting people know that the sidewalks are closed ahead. We're um, another thing that we found out in this process is that the the Drake's emergency exit is exits onto the library property. Um, so that is something that is important to maintain throughout construction. So our construction fencing um, creates a passageway for those individuals if they were to need to leave the building. Um, so they have their own five foot wide sidewalk area that's fenced and protected from the construction um, with an exit only gate to prevent people from um, congregating in that alleyway. Um, in addition, we have, are looking at the possibility of if there were, because the existing library is so close to the property line at the Historical Society, is within a foot of the property line today, um, we're actually going to be improving that condition. Um, we will be, in some cases, 10 feet, 8 and 10 feet away from the property line, but the we anticipate the contractor will need to be able to get some equipment in that area to be able to to take down the, the addition and to build new. Um, so we, we did meet with Alan Snow, the tree warden on site and how to protect that Norway maple, sorry, the Norway spruce and the um, heritage sycamore. And we're, this plan shows, um, show this is areas of area that's not to be, not to be accessed without explicit permission from the historical society and that if it is, they have to they have to use the wood cribbing to protect the roots and spread the weight out. All the gates um, will open in to the site so as to not cause issues with oncoming traffic. And, um, and all the gates will have Knox blocks also for coordination with the fire department and police departments. We also reached out to PBTA about um, where the bus stop that's currently in front of the storm house would be located. And um, currently they're thinking they might actually just discontinue it for, during the construction of the project um, because the library is anticipated to not be occupied during the construction and the nearest bus stop is 700 feet away. Um, so, in that case, though, we would not be relocating the bus stop. We would just be discontinuing the one in out front. Um, I, think, I think that's the main body of our presentation. Um, happy to answer questions or go through more of the plans in detail. All right. Thank you, uh, Tony and Rachel. Um, so we usually take a break around eight o'clock. So why don't we have some initial questions from the board and plan to take a break around that time. We can continue the discussion afterwards. Um, 
I want to start by calling on Janet. Uh, I believe when you were talking about the site lighting, Janet had her hand up for a while. Uh, Janet, would you like to ask a question about the lighting? Um, I actually, um, I have a printout of the lighting plan and then I tried to enlarge um, my screen to 300, whatever that means on my computer. And I, and there's just no way I can decipher the little tiny letters and numbers. So I don't know if you can give us um, a bigger, better copy. I don't know if it's what, what I can't see, but I, I can't see any, I think sometimes I saw what I thought was a letter, but I just. All right. I, uh, I see Chris's hand. Maybe she knows. Maybe she can so we you. we have a large, um, gosh, I think it's 24, 24 by 36 or possibly bigger than that image of this lighting plan. And um, I would be happy to show it to members of the planning board. Karin came in and looked at it yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. So we do have that available for people who want to come in. It's really quite big and you can read the numbers pretty easily. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um... Well, I, you know, I wrote down half a dozen questions along the way, but I'm sure some others did. So this is the time to start asking. Uh, Bruce, looks like you got your hand up first. Yes, uh, thank you, Doug. Um, I've got quite a few questions, but I'll start with four that are essentially questions of clarification, I think. Um, and uh, the, the first of those is, I noted uh, that the drawing calls for or, or synthetic slate on the roof of the uh, existing <laughs> existing library. Um, is this the uh, synthetic slate that uh, has been around for a while that involves uh, uh, recycled rubber, uh, car tires, that sort of thing, or is this a, a different type of uh, synthetic slate? Tony. I don't know, Josephine, are you also on deck here um, in terms yeah. of the specs? Yeah, this, this um, we're looking particularly at EcoStars Synthetic Slate. We've used that on, on a number of projects in our firm, and it has been around for a while. And, um, and, and you are correct, that's probably the similar to what you're referring to. Is it a, uh, a petroleum product, or is it a uh, sort of mortar-based or concrete-based product? Um, we could confirm and get back to you. It more like, most likely it's um, a, I don't want to say petroleum, but it's, I don't think it's uh, mortar-based. So we can get the specs to you that has all of the information behind it. Yeah, thank you. I've had, I've had this, I think this product along with Majestic Slate and a few others on my house, some up to 30 years and it's holding up quite well. So I don't have any concern about this. I just wanted to know whether there was something else out there that might have a, a shorter track record. So thank you for that. Uh, second, um, the uh, um, on the elevations, you showed uh, the white, sorry, you showed uh, the darker brick as uh, band as uh, is, is, is number one and the whiter band um, uh, the, the whiter, uh, lighter colored brick is number two, but between the two, there's a there's a white band, and that's not mentioned. And uh, could you enlighten us as to what that is? So we're we're looking at Aris Craft for that white band, that's which a, also, a as Tony mentioned, we product. have that sample um, is also at the library as well, along with the bricks. Yes, and 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 what is the say again? What it is? Aris Craft. Is that a, uh, a manufactured stone? Is it an architectural precast stone? Yeah. Okay. Um, just let me write that down. Um, then moving on. Oh, um, when you showed this, the close up of that uh, one and two, um, it looked like the, uh, the, the mortar between the coal brick is whiter. And the slate gray is a um, different color. Uh, on the board that you have in uh, Sharon's office, uh, both mortar uh, appears to be the same. So my, my question is, which, which, which is the, the more current, this one or what's in Sharon's office? 
what's in Sharon's office. The mortar is the same. Okay. And uh, finally, number the next one is um, uh, this is probably for Rachel. The uh, the, the, the 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 you you took us down the driveway on the east side, and and the big tree there that's kind of near where the dumpster where the electrical uh, vault is. Um, it said existing to remain. And at the site visit last night, I understood to be told that it would be coming down. So uh, obviously, I would like to know which. Sure. Um, what may, Tony, what may be helpful is to go to the, the technical plans at the back, to the demolition plans. I think it's the third, fourth plan, fifth plan in. Yeah, it's going to take a while because this is a big file. So it might take a second to load up. Just tell me when. Oh, there, we stopped there. Okay. Um, so Bruce, thanks for your question. The um, the rectangle in the in the in the corner there, um, that's the shed. Yeah. Yeah. And, yes, and that's correct. The left of that is a maple tree that's going to remain, so that'll be protected. Um, if we encounter roots, they'll be root pruned by a certified arborist um, and air spaded if needed. The tree just below that is the one that's growing into the sewer line. Right. And the one to the upper left of that is the one that's in the stormwater basin, basin area. Yes. Well, I'm talking about the one that is uh, um, down lower, uh, further to the south, down the driveway, and exactly on the eastern boundary. Oh, because okay. I first of all wanted to know whether it was uh, uh, our tree, so to speak. It's uh, well. It's it's that one there. Yeah. It says so, it says existing to remain. I think just there. Yeah. And and we were told last night that that tree was going away. At least that's what I understood. So maybe I misunderstood. But I just just want clarification. That's all. Yeah, that's a that's a pin oak. Um, we did review it a lot with Alan on site. Uh, it is one that probably could survive a lot of impact to its roots. Um, on the. I think two uh, a slide from now. Can you go down, Tony? One more slide. Another slide. Um, we're showing currently. We're we're showing protecting it. So um, okay, we're gonna do Remain. our best. Yeah, we're gonna do our best to keep it. And Doug, if I may, I have one more question. This is okay. a question, not All a right. not an item of clarification. Um, the so there are two trees that are going to be taken down, and they're huge, huge oak trees with um, quite long, straight trunks, uh, unbroken, without branches or anything on them. And when I look at trees like that, I think, oh boy, that tree uh, has got a lot of good wood in it. So my question is: Is any thought being given, or would any commitment be made to to take those trees out? Um, perhaps cut them into I don't know what lengths, um, 16, 20 foot, whatever you, and then cause them to be moved to a, a mill such as Wagner's, for example, and then used for the project or by somewhere else. But it seems to me that these trees would yield a really, um, I don't know, I've done a bit of milling before with, uh, with band mills and so forth, and I'm guessing maybe a thousand board feet of pretty high quality quarter sawn oak. And I thought that that's quite a valuable uh, and quite useful for cabinet grade lumber. And I wondered whether thought has been given to directing it in that way. So Rachel and Tony, should I take from the silence that no one has been thinking about that? We'd love I, I would guess, I would guess your whoever ends up being your landscape contractor is likely to think about that. Yeah, we would love for them to be repurposed. Um, we don't currently have that in our bid document contracts because that could involve hiring another contractor. Um, if you know of anyone who would be interested in collaborating with the, with the contractor on sourcing that, that would be wonderful. Okay, right. that's a good answer. I guess the other thing that occurs to me is it often takes uh, some number of months to season wood. Um, and so using it on this project may not be feasible unless you are able to cut it down 
well in advance of the start of construction. Doug, I think it might uh, receive kiln drying to accelerate yeah. that. Uh, it's, it seems to be such a high quality, potentially high quality uh, product that it might be worth doing that. I mean, I'm way at the edge of my uh, understanding of this topic. I just ask. So Rachel's answer is a good one. I'll uh, uh, see if I can find uh, from my sources anybody who can enlighten me as to the uh, where, uh, the the way in which uh, something like this might happen, and I, if I find anything out, I'll uh, get back to you. Okay, right. thank you. All right, Bruce. That's it for uh, me. Are you all set for now? Good. For now I am. Yes, thank you. All right, Johanna. Right. Thanks so much. Really appreciate the presentation. Um, I had really just two questions that um, both relate to the lighting plan. Um, first of all, I just, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness you're giving to reducing light pollution on the site and onto surrounding sites as much as possible. Um, and one question that I had was, have you considered um, having motion activated lights? Hmm. And my second question is, as you were going through the light exposure on the site, I was struck by how relatively much light there is in the rain garden. And given what we know about the impact of constant light on insects that are likely to, you know, make that rain garden home, I guess I would just encourage you to explore options to keep the lighting more on the path and not spilling over into the rain garden as much. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. All right, uh, Janet. Just to go top, try to stay on topic. I um, was wondering what the, you know, I don't know what the lighting numbers are, but what the lighting plan is because we, you know, in our bylaw required that lighting be downcast and shielded and turned off when the business is not in operation. On the other hand, um, that back, um, you know, that's a cut through area from the CVS lot to Main Street. And I wondered what it, what's the plan for when lights are on and when lights are off. Um, so that's one question. Um, about lighting, I thought the bollards in front of the Jones in the old section just seem really dissonant for the kind of very historic look. And I wonder if there's something, if there's some kind of lighting bollard that doesn't look super modern, like those ones that you had. And then um, another lighting thing is, I thought the west side of that yeah. really doesn't need that much lighting because really there's no use to it. As I don't, unless people are coming in through the door. I just thought it'd be, you know, not, darkness on that side would be really beneficial, I think, to the strong house in its traditional setting. Uh, Rachel, oh, any? Oh, can I also just throw in, since it's vaguely related, I was just wanting to, like, if we could walk through how someone walks through from the CVS lot to Amity Street. Like, they're going to, there's not like a, a separate lane from traffic or backing cars. That was a question I had. All right, Rachel? I wonder if I could share screen with the lighting, Tony, would that be all right? Sure, if I'll I, stop sharing. Let's see if we can, I can do this, share. Can you see this now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so to the question about the rain garden, one of the comments that we got from the design review board was they were very concerned uh, about having this well illuminated um, from, from the CVS lot to the north entry of the library. Um, there will be a lot of after hours programming in this area. Um, so making sure that we have a uh, good illumination from the CVS lot to the back of the building would be really important. I believe currently the plan is that the lighting 
uh, would uh, follow the hours of operation of the library. And if we need to make adjustments to that based upon your observation, I think, Janet, that's a great one about how this would might be used um, even after hours. That's something that um, we can we can talk about and love uh, Sharon um, to weigh into that conversation too. But at the back, so what we've done with those pole mounted fixtures, these A, a fixture here, a fixture here, a fixture here. Those are the pole mounted top fixtures. Um, we are spreading light along the pathway here and here and here. Um, and that does get us above that 0.5 foot candle. Due to the nature of the lights, it's a little bit brighter. It's um, three feet when it's closer to the light pole, um, but then it dips down to about 1.5. So some parts of the rain garden are 0 0.3, 0 0.7, um, but the inner area is brighter, as Joanna noted. Um, then as we get closer to the building, we have uh, the F6 series. And these are canopy mounted lights, so they're recessed into the canopy that's overhanging this area. Um, and that gets us around two, two to three foot candles. Um, a pretty uniform lighting around this this whole area. Um, and then we drop down to 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and again, um, it's most bright at the entry to the north and the catenary lighting on the suspended cable lights are here. So someone coming from part from the CVS slot would um, into the north entry after hours could come uh, straight down through this well what path there may be some light spillage from the library itself from these public spaces these nice wonderful big windows um, and then entry here and then people who are trying to use the library as a cut through would come through this well lit path this well lit area um, around the corner of the building uh, we have some wall packs here the f5 series along this side of the building kind of providing that illumination above 0.5. We have another pole mounted site fixture. Again, this is the one with the with the top limit. We do have a hot spot here. Uh, the reason why it's so high is that we were trying to get the spread to, to illuminate the path um, for wider range. We do have some building mounted fixtures here that are more of the historical size. We have a wall pack on the back of the dumpster area. So the dumpster area is well illuminated as well for safety after hours or during darker times. And then we have canopy lights underneath the canopy. Um, this is be actually becoming a, more of a service entry. So if deliveries, um, but this would not be used by the public. And then we have the two light fixtures in the parking area. And so from about a little over three or four down to about one foot candle. So it's pretty uniform. Um, so if you were coming from, from the CVS parking lot um, to get to the front of the building, you could either come through, go through the building and come out, come out this side using the elevator or stairs, or you could come through this walkway up along the service walkway, um, which is sized to for DPW trucks if they need to access anything in the back, but um, come through here and then walk around and to the sidewalk. And then folks from the front along Amity Street, if you're coming from Main Street or, or the Common, you can walk along here into the library. Or if you're coming from points west, you could come along Amity Street and walk in, walk in here. Um, as far as the egress area here on the west, this is an emergency egress. Um, so we have wall, recessed wall lights in the wall itself um, with one hot spot here. And then um, we do have a little bit of light trespass on the west side. And these are mostly from the historical fixtures, the F2 and the F3 that are causing um, a little bit of heat. These are the D, these are the bollard lights. That that you were saying um, that are more contemporary. Um, and then these are the, the seat wall lights that are underneath the underneath the wall. And we'll I'll scroll on over to this part. Um, so each of these lights 
our lighting designer has identified with each letter for the light fixture, it's bug rating. So for example, um, all of those post-mounted top lights, the A series, they have a zero up light, so they're definitely full cutoff, but some of them have various amounts of glare. Um, and, and so then, let's see, so these are the images of the this of the existing lights, the character that's on the on the library now that we're preserving, and they of course um, don't don't meet the current standards that we're trying to achieve with lighting, but they do have a historical value that we're trying to preserve. Um, and then the F five series are the wall wall mounted lights that are in the back of the site on the contemporary edition. And the F6 are the, the lights that are recessed underneath the canopies that are not visible um, that help the canopies act as full cutoff. Okay. I'll stop sharing. And Tony, I'll let you let you go back to, to sharing. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Janet, did you have more questions or did that address your, your questions for now? Janet, you're muted. Sorry, those are just questions I had about the pathways and the lighting. Okay. All right. Um, I don't see any more hands. I'll ask a couple of clarification questions. Uh, on the site plan, you've described the parking that's uh, off of Amity Street. And um, I wondered how far back or far, how far north uh, you customarily expect vehicles to be. Uh, particularly since that seems to be a primary pedestrian cut through uh, around the building. Uh, at what point as a pedestrian do I need to be concerned that there would be vehicles? That's great. We're using on the site, that's great, Tony. That's a perfect one. On the site plan, we are marking where the pedestrian zone really begins and ends with um, unitized pavers in the, in, in the parking area. Um, it's kind of an indication that the parking area is on one side and that you're entering a new zone. Um, that plus the dumpster and the change in materials. Um, so the parking area is asphalt mm -hmm. and then the walkway is concrete. So I think those those three or four things together kind of will help code that you're in you're in a pedestrian, you're in a different zone. So the dumpster closure will kind of act as a as a as a narrowing. Um, and then we will have signage also for, you know, no vehicles beyond this point. Um, but then, then we also have the queuing of the, of the unitized pavers and, and, and the service area. So from the point of view of the daily operation of the library, there's no need for delivery or service to go beyond that change in pavement. Nobody to go beyond the uh, dumpster enclosure. I right. think if we did have a service truck, like a like a, a box truck of some sort or a, a van, um, they could pull beyond the unit pavers into that zone between the unit pavers and the dumpster area. Um, and then when the dumpsters do come and pick up uh, trash, they would they would ex drive up to the dumpsters open the gates and um, empty the dumpsters in their container. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was just concerned about things like the interlibrary li loan truck and uh, you know whatever happens on a normal day. Okay, so then um, second of all, uh, the ornamental trees you have around the front of the building are uh, in your renderings, they're, they're small and they're ornamental. Uh, are they of the species that will stay small or will they eventually get too big and dwarf, you know, or obscure the front of the building? That's great. We had a, some really good feedback um, from multiple people on, on the tree selection. So we've had input from the tree committee, some members of the gardening committee. Um, so both the magnolia tree and the sourwood um, are, are not going to dwarf the front of the tree the front of the building. Okay. Uh, and then the last question, I guess, uh, I guess it would be you guys that could enlighten me about a historic preservation 
restriction that's on the, if, whether it's on the building or is it on the property? And uh, being more of a modernist myself, I just wondered whether you, you were really prohibited from having more contemporary fixtures on site uh, ex, uh, or not. It extends to both the property and the building. So any any landscape improvements have to go for review by the historic commission under the preservation restriction. Um, so so, it's, so is it really up to the historic commission? If 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 tonight they're feeling like contemporary fixtures are okay, they might approve that, or or you know they would consistently say you need to have a circa 1925 fixture uh, on that property? Um, the National Park Service outlines a, a, like nine different points of criteria that we should use when um, undertaking a project like this. And uh, one of the tenants is both to preserve what's there in character, but not try to emulate it exactly. Um, so there's, a, there's language that would suggest that um, contemporary fixtures are access, acceptable on the property as long as they, um, you know, as long as they're not trying to be, to be the same. Um, so it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a um, understanding what you're protecting and then also being really clear about what is new. Um, and a lot of that interpretation and evaluation um, I believe, and Christine and Nate can advise, I believe that is often under the, the historic commission's purview. Okay, thank you. Bruce, why don't we get to your questions and then we'll take a break. It's one question, Doug, and uh, it's just to follow up from your observation, which I had as well. It's another one of my, on my list here, but a good time to ask it, I think. I, too, uh, looked at those F1, F2, F3, and F4 fixtures and had more or less the same reaction, I think, to you. It seems to me that we are, uh, you know, this we've had 100 years of lighting uh, technology improvement, and I would hope that we could uh, benefit from that on the project. And particularly, I think it's been uh, clear for years that these kind of uh, lantern lights hung adjacent to doorways are kind of atrociously glary they're very uncomfortable to walk into and uh, uh and and so i would wonder whether and why we couldn't um uh, create them either on the building and have them wash the wall below them or uh, uh, use uh, whether uh, uh, uh canopies uh, porches and so forth simply install them into the ceiling plane of the porch because uh, um, it seems to me that this is going to be a fairly disagreeable experience for people who are approaching these entrances at night. And I would love to think that I wouldn't be uh, confronted with glary light fixtures just because that's the way they were a hundred years ago. Can we, uh, can we, can you move the ball forward on that? I'm not sure who you addressed that to Bruce. Oh, I I guess it's to a, a fine called Alexander, but I'm not sure because, uh, yes, I think there are lights off the building. All these air fixtures look like they're building mounted illumination. And and I, whoever is uh, uh, more familiar with the, uh, as you asked, the restrictions of the historic preservation order. Um, I mean, I know that the secretary standards can be unreasonably um, uh, recalcitrant in this way. So uh, I'm not necessarily expecting that common sense can prevail here, but it would be nice if it could, and we could uh, take advantage of what we've learned over the years. All right, I see Nate's hand. Maybe he's got a comment about that. Sure, yeah, I think Rachel uh, summarized the restriction pretty well. So, you know, the library has received CPA funds uh, on a number of occasions. And so there's a preservation restriction uh, you know, approved by the Massachusetts Historical Commission. And the review is local when there are changes. And so the restriction has guidelines in terms of what's under review. It's everything in the landscape uh, to changes in the building. It's really dealing with the exterior of the site, both proper, you know, site and building. And so um, they have guidelines in terms of what is considered major or minor alterations and when that needs to be reviewed. 
So like a removal of mature trees or landscaping needs to be reviewed, uh, lighting, changes to buildings, demolition, changes in material. In this project, you know, the National Park Service has uh, four categories in terms of historic preservation, you know, if it's rehabilitation, strict preservation, restoration. And so this is a rehabilitation project and it does allow for modern materials or, you know, modern additions. And so some of it is balancing, you know, what does that mean? And where it, you know, how does that, how is that applied? Um, and so, you know, the chair of the historical commission attended a workshop on this and said, you know, they said, for instance, this rear addition that's happening, it actually is better if it uses modern material and takes on modern form, uh, because it is, it's a, it's a, it's a modern addition. It's, it would be really, unless you're going to really make it look exactly like it was built in 1927, it, it could actually look like a cheap imitation. And so, uh, in terms of the lighting. Um, you know, some of that was not just necessarily driven by the preservation restriction. It may have been what was decided by the building committee of the library, perhaps just because it was keep in keeping with what was there on the building. I'm assuming that, you know, the lumens or the light color could be adjusted so it's not um, as glaring as boosts as, you know, older lights could be, right? You could have a softer, warmer light, um, just enough to provide the you know the the foot candles necessary to illuminate the the doorway or walkway and so um you know the preservation restriction doesn't preclude a modern fixture it would just need to be reviewed by the historical commission um and so that's you know we didn't prescribe these these light fixtures as part of the restriction um and you know the, this was what was presented the historical commission had a few comments on it but by and large the commission um approved the plans as as they were presented tonight and so uh you know, if there are changes made, it might be that it has to go back before the historical commission for a review too, just on those features. Um, you know, one thing, for instance, that was discussed was the the windows in the original library. They're trying to keep true divided light, but simulated divided light where there's um, nothing between the glazing could be acceptable. And so, you know, that's something that, um, you know, is, is to me is not that big of a deal from the street, but, you know, they are really trying to keep keep the character of the windows and have a true divided light, uh, even with the new windows. Um, so, you know, I, I think that for the, for the planning board, I think, you know, you should go through it and have recommendations. And if things need to go back to the commission, to me, that's, that would just be the process. Um, you know, or we can consider it, is it major enough that it needs to come back depending on what the changes are. All right. Thank you, Nate. That's very helpful. All right, Bruce, uh, since you only had one question, I'm going to assume your hand is just a legacy. And uh, the, so we'll, we'll go ahead and have a break. And uh, Janet, I know you had your hand up and pulled it back down so we can, we can entertain more questions after the break. So I have uh, 8.12 at the moment. So we usually take a five minute break. I think uh, that'll bring us to 8.17. So if you all can uh, turn off your cameras, mute yourself, and uh, plan to be back uh, with your video on so we know you're back at 817. Thank you. Doug, Doug what is your anticipated uh, end time? Uh, we generally don't have any idea when things will end. Okay. Um, Thank you. You know, I mean, we probably won't want to go much beyond, I don't know, 9.30 or something this evening, depending on how the conversation goes. Thank you.
All right, it's 8.18 and I see Janet's back. As you all trickle back in, please turn on your video. Great. All right, we've got all the board members back. Um, I realized during the break, a uh, couple of things I should say. One is uh, in my earlier disclosure, I did not realize that Tony Shaw was going to be part of the presentation. And I had some uh, limited amount of interaction with Tony when uh, his firm worked on the chapel renovation at UMass. So, uh, Good to see you again, Tony. Uh, the second thing is we, we neglected to have any site visit report and um, went immediately into some questions, which was fine. Um, I was one of a number of us uh, from the board and uh, Chris was along with us on a site visit last night. Um, are there any other members who were on that uh, walk that wanna give an overview of what uh, we witnessed when we were there. If there are, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll try to remember what happened. Uh, we met out front uh, with a couple of members from Berkshire Design. And we heard about the grade changes on the south side of the building um, and uh, some descriptions of the changes to the entry to the, to the building and that Tony mentioned this evening. Uh, we walked around the east side and talked about the parking. Uh, that was the point at which uh, we heard about some of the trees that were going to be taken down, uh, that the current handicapped entrance is now would, would turn into a uh, staff entrance. Uh, we walked around the back to the south side, uh, looked at the shed first and the trees around the shed talked about the rain garden, uh, walked around to the entrance at the, on the north side and talked about the, uh, the site wall and the, the way the, the entrance is actually gonna shift. Uh, that's where we first saw the portion of the building that would be demolished, uh, the, the 1990 whatever portion of the building. Uh, I think I was surprised to realize that the north end of the original building uh, is going to remain and will actually be subsumed in the addition that's coming farther north. And that in, on the inside of the building, you will be able to see that wall um, uh, from whatever space you're in, in that, in that portion of the addition. Um, so we stayed there uh, on the north side for a while, and then we walked up uh, along the steps onto the uh, west side of the building and talked about the property line and how close it is and how it would move farther back, that most of that portion of the building would be removed all the way up to the porch and including the porch that's on the west side. And at that point, I think we were all cold enough that we were ready to move on. Uh, some people went inside and looked at the physical samples of the materials that uh, are proposed and some of us left. So that would be my synopsis of the site visit last night. Um, board members uh, who were there, anything you want to add to that? No, I'm seeing some heads shake no. So for what it's worth, that was our site visit report. Uh, so we can go on with questions. And um, so I'm hoping somebody else other than me has, has a few additional questions. All right, well, I'll ask a couple more. Um, 
get mine taken out of the way. Um, I guess, Tony, uh, last night and this evening, I, I, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, plaza at the front of the building and how you're, you're changing the entry, so raising the, the plaza on the south side so that there's a, you know, an accessible path into the front door. And the thing I was concerned about was those white clabbered projections on the south side of the building and that by raising the grade there, you might be above the wood, the wood uh, structure of those two protrusions, left and right. And uh, how you might, whether, whether by raising the grade there, you're actually gonna be causing the sills of those to, be, to rot out pretty fast. Can I address that, Tony? So, Tony, would that be you or would that be Rachel? Tony, do you want me to address that? Yeah, Josephine, sorry. I was muted. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Uh, not, not very well. I'll try to speak a little bit. I think my headset just has to get um, uh, acclimated. I think the voice will change soon. This is a Zoom issue that I have sometimes. Um, let me know if you can't hear me, though. I'll try to speak up for now. Um, yes, we are addressing those sides where the wings are. Um, we will be, um, uh, we're detailing that now as we speak. Um, we will be raising that up because we don't want the issue of the wood rotting. So um, so that will be coming up as needed um, to be addressed at that, new at that new grade at the plaza. So you're hoping to raise the foundation in that area rather than say pull the we're uh, we're pulling pull. the wood up. Yes. You're pulling the wood up. Okay. Yes. All right. I wondered whether you might be holding the plaza back, you know, away from the wood by 18 inches or 24 inches and letting it breathe. But okay, good. I'm glad you're thinking about it. Yeah, but Rachel be well, Rachel and Jess both have been working with us collaborating and we're still working through the the intricacies of the of the edge detailing there, but that's that's the goal at the moment. Okay. All right. Um, and then the uh, this is the the rain garden uh, bridges, I guess you'd call them, that are are made out of a metal grating. Mm -hmm. I just wondered kind of what the dimensions of those gratings are and what kinds of footwear and other things, uh, you know, skateboards are gonna be able to be getting across that bridge or are they gonna be, uh, you know, have a difficulty on that kind of grading? Yeah, and Tony, I don't know if you could scroll into our technical drawing set. We have some details for those. Um, and, and Jess, I'm gonna enlist you also on this question. Um, the grate is a pre-manufactured pre grate system that can be used in sidewalks or tree surrounds. I believe it's ex accessibility rated. Um, I, Jess, do you know offhand what the opening size is for those? Uh, I, don't, I don't know offhand, but it is accessibility rated. Um, they used it um, at another college. Um, it's Iron Age grate. And the length of them is about 17 feet. All right. Well, I guess I just want to express that as a concern. Um, and I guess the last question was, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure you'd really want to entertain it, but uh, you know, when I'm thinking about sustainability and solar gain versus thermal loss, um, on the north side of buildings, I often see or think about having fewer windows uh, and uh, a little more uh, wall assembly. And I just wondered whether you'd, what's going on inside the, is what's, what's in the spaces on the north side of the building that need all those windows? I'm gonna see if I can get to the plans, um, back to the plans.
Thanks, Tony. I appreciate your scrolling for all of us. Sorry, it's you know, <laughs> computers trying to labor as best it can at home, but. So on that north side, um, while this is sharpening up, what we have going on in this particular instance is that we have the adult um, fiction area and there's a large group of seating area against this north wall. And that's shown in this location, sorry, here. Mm -hmm. And that occurs on level two, which is the lower level of that um, bay element. And then on the upper level plan, basically it's the it's the young active um, adult area. So this is a very high um, youth space. Both of them are very high youth. And I think the, the attitude about that design approach, and I do appreciate your comments, um, Doug, but I think their thinking was that really in order to engender um, a feeling of a little bit more um, lightness as it were, in addition to the programmatic use inside, we, we put, put forth the idea that it's almost more like a bay element uh, along that side. So in order to do that, we wanted to frame this in order to have a larger opening. So it's also, ex it, it's sort of creating expansive use to the to the really nice gardens that mm -hmm. Rachel is developing. And I think that will attract a lot of patron interest, um, particularly looking to this side. So for those reasons of both use patterns on these levels, as well as the frame views and the fact that we're attempting to make the appearance of this element um, relatively light, that's what drove the design. The, of course, the windows will be, as you know, I mean, we're, we're trying to achieve a high level of sustainability, and these will be very energy efficient um, systems. And um, we are, you know, working within the parameters of the balance of solid to void ratios throughout the whole library, in terms of amount of window versus solid. So I think it's a balancing act, um, but we did feel it was part of the a critical aspect about the design that drove those decisions. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's an attractive elevation. I just wondered if you considered that yes no it's a very good question and we right. definitely are looking at all of these issues carefully all right um bruce okay uh, i probably got another five questions they didn't all have to be asked and answered tonight but uh, i'll go another two i think this is a good elevation actually tony um, because it, it, it exactly illuminates my question. The uh, west uh, elevation of the existing uh, low uh, portion of the library here, on the south side, which is to say the right-hand side, the existing roof curves down to the fascia, and you are replacing the uh, roof on the north side. Um, at the moment, it does also curve down, but you're replacing it with a roof that doesn't curve down. And I'm wondering uh, if you could explain uh, your design reasoning for that, because it feels to me as though uh, it would be uh, elegant to maintain the uh, symmetry of the uh, of the curvaceousness of this end of the existing building. Um, really good question. Um, we are continuing to refine the study of this particular area as we speak. Um, the existing portion, um, which we're removing, as you rightfully point out, Bruce, does extend, you know, connecting to a, an element that goes like that. And the, the curve is doing something rather different. But when we remove all that portion there, um, we are, of course, um, replacing this particular area with a new sort of extension of the roof. Um, but with respect to your question about symmetry vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, having this last like curve or kick out, um, I think these are these are still at the level of details that we are continuing to refine. I don't know, Joseph, if you know, there's anything else you want to add. Um, it, it is a it is a important area and it is a transition area between the historic part and the new. Yes, yeah, th thank you. That's very helpful. So uh, we just stay tuned, I guess. Yes. Uh, Doug, if I may, my next sure. question is a change from the historic and the elevational to the uh, parking. Um, and I, I guess we are going to uh, be asked to uh, provide a waiver here. Um, and it's a, and it's been done before, and it's a pretty, pretty colossal waiver from 500 plus spaces down to, I don't know, single digits. And I understand, I think, pretty clearly the logic for doing that and certainly the logic for not trying to be stupid with parking so it it feels right to me and i i just wanted to uh 
uh, preface my question with the sense that, that I, I think I understand uh, the out of the possible here with parking and 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 what's necessary and what's related to you know how it relates to all of the other facilities, parking and pedestrian and uh, public transport and so forth around. So at the moment, in principle, I'm fairly comfortable with that. The one question is that uh, whereas you have two um, uh, handicapped accessible spaces, you're also providing a an EV charging station. And I have to say that it occurred to me as I thought about that, that you've got one of these seven or nine spaces, I can't remember exactly, one of these spaces, which would seem to have a rather precious use. And it might not be... Um, I, I don't know how these EV charging stations work, except when, uh, well, actually, I don't really know how they work. Uh, I don't know how the market, how, how the whole uh, infrastructure is kind of uh, evolving and so forth. But it does seem here that a, a single one of these spaces dedicated with an EV charging station might not be the best place in town to have an EV charging station. And I wondered what uh, how, how, what your thoughts would be on that. Yeah, I, I, I think the EV charging area is actually for the library van. So the library is hoping to transition to an EV powered vehicle. Um, okay. Do you want to speak to this a little bit? Yeah, uh, Bruce, love your question. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, it's for the library van. We just purchased our first all electric. It's the delivery vehicle that we use for interlibrary loans to go back and forth between all three of the buildings. So it's it's for the library van only. Thank you very much. That's a great answer. And I think it answers Doug's question. I'm I'm a little confused by the answer that Tony gave to um, Bruce. Are you still designing the West Side? Are you still working on the design for that? And then also, are are you still working on the windows with the historic commission? I'm just kind of no. So so I clarify. So the question that Bruce raised is, has to do with a particular transition at the element on the west elevation that that basically kicks the piece of the roof. Um, which it's this part right here. And we are right now in the process of, in just this one small area here, uh, continuing to uh, refine that part of it. So nothing else is changing on the rest of the design. It's a very, it's a very focused area that's only concentrated here. Okay. Um, I had some questions when I was reading through the, um, the last permit um, that was given for the la the current um, expansion or previous expansion, 1990. And there was a lot of um, requirements and discussion about the Amherst Historical Society. And, you know, basically they approved the new design of the old edition. And then also um, there were different easements um, for to going on site and then insurance for protecting them. And I just wondered what your process has been with the Amherst Historical House, so, Historical Society and the Strong House, because it seemed like there was a lot of in, interaction and a lot of concern by the planning board on the look of the building, its relationship to the Strong House, protecting the Strong House and things like that. So if you could talk about that relationship and what's been going on there, it'd be very helpful to me. Sure. Um, we, we met, we've First of all, um, representatives of the Strong House and the Historical Society have come to many of the meetings throughout this process and have provided input, which we've incorporated. Um, in addition, we met with um, two representatives of the Strong House Museum prior to this meeting and talked through the specifics of construction and logistics. In parallel to this effort, I believe Bob Parrott is working on uh, coordinating a temporary easement for construction, uh, um, if any of it is required on their property and any permanent easements that might be required for that retaining wall on the property. Okay, and then um, in terms of just another vaguely a related question, are you where are you keeping your construction vehicles overnight? We we are currently showing the area on the on the logistics plan um, for the contractor. Um, a lot of these, a lot of these areas are kind of 
unfortunately a little bit unknown until we bring the GC on site. Um, we are requiring that they provide a logistics plan for review to the OPM and to the town. Um, but we have talked, Bob Parrott has been coordinating on that front also. There's some talk about a possible use of a portion of the town lot that is north of the CVS lot, a portion of that um, for any of the con additional construction logistics that may be required. Um, but the number of spaces are unknown right now um, because it has to be coordinated with other projects going on in town, as well as we would need permission from the CVS folks uh, to cross their property um, with any equipment or, or parking. Um, there's also some discussion of possibly the VS, VFW site, which is a half mile down the road on Main Street as another place for, for parking and, and storage of materials. Um, but th that's something that um, that the town is, is helping helping work out. And again, in, in the early, early part of 2024, um, this, this plan will be refined based upon input from a GC. And then have you had conversations with the owner of the CVS property about crossing their property and using it? Yeah, we've started those conversations. Um, there are multiple parties with um, with rights and, and interest in that property. And so we've been trying to coordinate, coordinate sitting down with them, but they are aware and, and we are talking about what that would entail. And then is the, I guess one, one of the, I may just have to make this observation. I, um, from the west side, the building, I mean, the Jones Library is a quirky building and has tons of detail. It has tons of different materials, um, lots of windows, you know, it's just kind of a quirky, beautiful thing. And, you know, from, I was kind of taken aback by the size of the addition on the rear, but, you know, I was thinking to myself during a site visit in the dark, that in a way it's a big change. It's, you know, you know, but it's kind of out of view. But to me, the West Side really doesn't, it just, it's just doesn't match or mix well with the strong house and all the buildings around. And I'm not sure how to articulate that. It's just kind of very plain and bland looking facade with very few changes. And then it sort of imitates the um the um, Dutch gambrel, but it just looks kind of puffy. And I just wondered if, you know, is there a way to change that to make it more fitting or more something? And, you know, did the Amherst Historical Society have a feeling that, you know, what were their views on that or discussions about that? And actually what do my other board members think? Any regards to the Josephine, do you want to talk about Yeah, I, I, I don't know who from the design team would be the persons to talk about that, but sounds like it would be productive to hear sort of a recap of the conversations with the historical um, museum. I don't know, Tony, if you want to take that. Yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, the, the whole gist of this, um, attempt at this project was to mitigate the scale of a, you know, a substantial addition. And with respect to trying to maintain the historic fabric of the main front portion of the library and create a, a complementary knob but not be for one imitative of that. And I think the second, as I think we showed in the elevations and the massing studies in particular on this side is that the portion of the massing does scale um, back against it. It's of the library extent this side here. I think we are purposely keeping the overall height certainly below the roof line of the main body of the historic portion of the library in front. Um, we turned, you know, towards the uh, sort of modified gambrel end here in order to mitigate the mass and step back the plane of the roof. We are introducing, you know, uh, different scale windows which is in keeping with the character of the new edition. And the materiality of it is in, in, in attempt to be 
complementary, but again, not to mimicry. And by the way, just so you know, in this particular rendering, that tree is not limbed up like that in reality. So that, that existing tree comes all the way down. So to a large extent, the addition, even from this viewpoint, certainly from this vantage point, will be almost not visible because the tree, uh, to the extent that it's there, really obscures it. We just did the, for the purpose of the rendering in order to make the addition visible. But I think we do we did feel that it is a it is a balance between the historic complementing the scale, but also acknowledging that this is something new, and um, we are we are you know not attempting to mimic, um, but we're trying to complement. And I think a lot of the things that address both the relationship of the of the massing, and I think the reading from other um, local groups have in generally been supportive of this. So I think we've, you know, this has been in front of folks for, um, you know, for a while. And I think uh, we did a lot of things to try to mitigate uh, scale and elements that we we can uh, in order to create the addition that we are proposing. Okay. So um, can I can yeah. I just piggyback on on what Tony was saying? So the strong house folks, they have been uh, they've been great uh, sports with us throughout. You know, we've been working on this for 12 years and, and they've been coming to all of our meetings and and they've commented on materials and, you know, the the way the roof looks and, and all of that. So and we've gotten nothing but but positive feedback from them to date. So thank you. All right. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. Do you want to weigh in on this? No, I have a non sequitur. Oh, um, well, go I ahead. Go noticed on. that Fred Hartwell was not among our panelists. And so I checked my email about 10 minutes ago and realized he didn't have the link and so couldn't join the meeting. So I sent him the attendees link, but I'm not sure that he's still you know, interested or able to join. So I just wanted to say he, that he is among the attendees. He is among the attendees. Yes. Great. So maybe Pam can let him in okay. as a panelist. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Great. That's it. All right. Welcome to Fred. We're sorry we didn't let you in sooner. All right. Um, I don't see any other hands from board members, so maybe this is a good time to take some public comment. So we have, uh, well, I'm counting 13 public attendees at this point, and I know some of them are related to the applicant, but uh, members of the public, this would be the time for you to raise your hand and uh, you can have up to three minutes for a public comment about the library. Do we have any members, anybody that would like to make a comment from the public? Okay, I am not seeing any raised hands from the public. I guess we can go back to our board discussion. So I will say, um, I don't think we're really prepared to vote on this project this evening. I, I expect we will continue this hearing, these three hearings to a, uh, another date. Um, if, if questions come up that the, the design team needs to get back to us with uh, answers, we can do that at the next meeting. And we haven't heard from a couple of the town departments um, I think it was, was it Chris, I forget, was it, it was fire and maybe the, sit, the town engineer who needed to comment on this project? That's right. Fire and the town engineer need to comment. Um, Bob Parent, who is the capital projects coordinator, has been speaking with them. And I understand that the design team has been meeting with them regularly, but they haven't given us anything in writing. Okay. All right. Um, I know uh, Mr. Surratt asked earlier how long our meeting was likely to go, and I couldn't tell him. Um, if we don't have a lot more discussion this evening, we could we could end soon. Um, Bruce, I uh, thank you for bringing your hand up. 
Well, I I I, I prepared to move uh, that the we continue the well the three special permit hearings to uh, a a, 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 to and then insert the date and do uh, Chris, can you advise uh, what that date and time might be? It can either be December sixth or December twentieth. Uh, I right. guess we could ask the applicants uh, what they're. Uh, I guess they would prefer us to move quicker rather than yeah, slower. Sooner is probably better. Uh, sooner but, would be better. Chris, do you think that the fire department and uh, city engineer are likely to have comments by the sixth? We can um, we can pursue them. <laughs> Pam and okay. I will pursue them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and we will also have draft conditions and draft findings on that day. Right. I know your development report wasn't completely finished either. Mm -hmm. So I, Fred is now in the meeting and I, Fred has raised his hand. So since we kept him from making comments until now, why don't, Fred, why don't you uh, unmute yourself and tell us what you want to say? Doug, a point of order, is, is my motion uh, uh, tabled for the moment or, or just dismissed for the moment and we'll come back? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Bruce. Um, I'm happy to withdraw yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, let's table it for the for a minute. We've just I want to give Fred a chance, and then I know Karen had her hand up. Fred, uh, we we can't hear you. Oh no, you are unmuted. I can see, but we cannot hear you. No. Nope. No. No audio. At least that I'm hearing. And, but you appear to be unmuted. Okay. Thank you for thank you for trying. All right. Uh, Bruce, why don't we go on back to your uh, motion? So you you made a motion to continue the three hearings to a date certain, and the, uh, yes, uh, proposing uh, December sixth. Yes, I suppose it would be six forty or six thirty five on December sixth. Yes. And might I make a suggestion that we uh, uh, that staff or somebody help Fred there because Fred is this is not the first time that Fred's had audio problems, and I think we need to have him in the meeting. I'd like to know that he can be, there's some support here that can get him in. Yeah, I guess the other thing he could do would be to phone in maybe. Um, Chris, you have your hand up? Yes, we have had people phone in when they can't make their audio work so that they have their image on Zoom, but then they um, have their voice come through on the phone. I also wanted to suggest if if Fred was not watching on Amherst Media, um, that he would be, um, it would be good if he would be watching a video of this meeting so that he would be able to vote. Maybe he mm -hmm. was watching on Amherst Media, but if not, um, Pam or I can send him a link to the video when that becomes available. So then he can attest to the fact that he watched okay. the meeting. Fred, would you gesture to make sure you can hear us? Is that right? Okay. All right, so you've heard what Chris said. Okay. So, uh, so I'm good with the motion. Yes, you have a motion on the floor. And uh, does anybody want to second it? Or I guess I'm happy to second your motion. Any further comment from board members? No. Okay. All right, we'll go through a roll call to continue the hearings to December 6th. Um, starting Bruce with you. Aye. And Jesse. Aye. And Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And Fred, I'm going to say if you're okay with that, give me a thumbs up. There you go. Thank you. I'm going to record you as an I as well. And I'm an I as well. We have seven votes in favor of 
con continuation um, to the applicant, the design team and the library staff and the library trustee who's here. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. We, Thank appreciate, you all. we appreciate it. Thank you very much. So we'll see at least some of you back on December 6th. Yep. Have a good Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, going, moving along with the agenda. The time now is 8.53. Next item is old business, not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Chris, I, anything? I don't have anything. Okay. Um, does Pam or Nate have anything? Okay, I do see Janet's hand. Um, I have a quick question about the RFP and are we getting bites or any updates? The RFP uh, for design services, design yes. guidelines. Yes. yes, we have three responses, and we're putting together a group to um, to uh, look at those and choose a um, a consultant to work with us. Excellent. That's okay. exciting. All right. Uh, next item is new business. Un 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 unreasonable or not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Chris, anything? I don't have anything about Nate or Pam. Do they have anything? No, no. no. Okay. Form A, A and R subdivision application. None. No, nothing. Upcoming ZBA applications. Anything new? And no to report. Uh, Pam, we cannot hear you, but you've been shaking your head no. Okay. Um, um, com coming special permit or site plan review subdivision applications. We have a uh, an application that we're pretty uh, certain is going to come in soon, and it is for the um, trails at Hickory Ridge. Um, Pam and I are working with um, Jen Mullins of our department and Dave Zomek to put together that application. So that should be coming to you sometime in December. My guess is it would be December 20th. Okay. By the way, Chris, do we have any other agenda items on December 6th? I'm not aware of anything. Okay. Nate or Pam? No. No. All right. All right, um, just time check, it's 8.56. Looks like we're up to item nine on the agenda, planning board committee and liaison reports. Uh, Bruce, we'll start with you for Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, nothing to report, there, there, except that they're having a, uh, an annual gathering uh, kind of party. Uh, which I, I don't think I'm going to, but uh, uh, I have, there hasn't been a meeting. Uh, there will be shortly, um, but not yet. Okay. Uh, for CPAC, um, I will report that we are now in the midst of our season of more intense meetings. Uh, we had the first four, maybe four proposals presented to our meeting last week. Uh, we have more, more proposals uh, being presented uh, tomorrow night. And we have a pretty intense, I think, weekly schedule through the, roughly through the end of the year. Um, and that's really all I have to report about CPAC. Uh, DRB, uh, Design Review Board, Karen? Uh, nothing to report this time. Okay. Janet, Solar Bylaw, you are muted. It, it's a miracle, but we do have a final draft. Um, nobody's in love with it, but there's enough people in like with it that we got votes. And then Chris is um, like renumbering it and putting it into sort of form. And I can't say when that will be done. And then um, there's going to be some reports that the board has to approve, the, the bylaw working group, I'm sorry, not the board. And then... Um, then it will go to town council and its fate at that point will be decided. Is that, is that accurate, Chris? Yes, we will be presenting it. Um, Dwayne Breger and Stephanie Ciccarello and I will be presenting it to town council on December 4th. 
and there will be a memo to accompany it. And um, we we will be putting in all of the changes that were agreed to at last week's final meeting of the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Okay. So did you say the final meeting of the Solar Bylaw Working Group? We had the final meeting last week on the 9th. All this right. was for celebration. Okay, so we can take this off the agenda for future meetings. Mm -hmm. I mean, Janet, if you want to, you know, <laughs> I don't want to keep can... talking about it. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying the topic of the solar bylaw will be will will come back to us. But I, I didn't no, mean. I, I assume <laughs> if if town council likes it enough, they will refer it to us, and we'll actually have it on our agenda. Yes. Okay. And then it's not going to be like hidden under wraps if you wanted to look at the draft. So once Chris is done. Okay, that would be great. All right, and then CRC, Chris, anything to fill us in on? Yes, the rental registration bylaw is going to uh, town council. And I understand from talking to Rob Mara that um, the first reading will either be this coming Monday, which I think is the 20th of November, or it will be um, the following time, which would be December 4th. It'll either be, so November 20th or December 4th will be the first reading and then they'll have a second reading and hopefully they'll approve it. So you sent us the, I guess the text of that bylaw proposal and you also sent some comments from the town attorney. Uh, will is it likely that the town attorney's comments will influence that bylaw or at this point, is it too late to change it? I think that the town attorney's comments will influence the bylaw, but I'm not sure exactly how. But when I spoke with Rob Mora today, he didn't think that the um, comments were substantial enough to really you know, derail it in any way. Um, he thought they were reasonable comments. Uh -huh. Okay, Janet. You know, I, I'm I'm sort of surprised to hear that. I was a little I was sort of confused because it sounded like, oh, you can't enter people's apartments, rental apartments or apartments without permission, you know, because it's violating a constitutional right. And so that did seem substantial to me. But I also wondered, like, how does the Board of Health inspect restaurants and you know schools and all the things that they do? So it seemed to me. Like, is it, there must be a workaround to that saying you can't get a rental permit unless you consent to this, or did you have a sense of that? Or is that, am I going too deep? I think um, you'd have to pay attention to the CRC meetings. I'm not into it enough to know the answer. Maybe Jesse knows he raised his hand. Yeah, I saw a draft of it. I, my understanding was it was just about scheduling. It wasn't, that, it wasn't unannounced permitting. Uh, visits, Janet. It was the landlord. The issue I understood was, was they're making the landlord schedule additional visits, and that's what's the objection. And hmm. Okay. Nate, I see your hand. Maybe you have another take on it. Yeah, no, I, I spoke with Rob Moore, the building commissioner, a little bit on that point in the um, in another one, and you know, he said all the inspectors kind of work under that condition right now of how do you enter a property, and so. Um, you know, he thought the the legal opinion from KP Law was more about just raising awareness of, you know, how you have to be cautious when you do that, not that you can't, right? So uh, when there's inspectors, if there's complaints, if it's part of the rental registration, sure, it can't be unreasonable. So there has to be notice given. Um, and not, it's not as if, you know, you we just come unannounced and they, you know, go in. And so um, that's the way the inspectors operate now anyways. You know, they schedule it with the property manager or landlord and it's part of a program so or it's a complaint-based inspection so that doesn't change the rob said what was written in that memo doesn't change the way they would operate it um okay, okay. thank you that help. that's very helpful all right all right anything else on crc chris nope okay all right the time is 902 uh report of the chair the chair has no report Chris, any report of staff? No, I have no report. Thank you. All right. Anything else from anyone on the board or staff? Anything else oh. we want to talk about? 
May I just remind everybody that we do have a meeting scheduled, an in-person meeting on November 29th. Mm -hmm. That would be my report. And I hope that you all, you're all able to come. And it would start at six o'clock. Six. Right, Bruce? Yes. <laughs> okay. So everybody have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. And we are adjourned at 9.03. Excellent. All right. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Brad, we got to fix your audio, man. And then on your computer is just something on your computer is just not plugged in. <laughs>